Pleasure to welcome you all here. Uh, pleasure to continue the discussion. Many of you have been here for prior sessions we've done in the area of, uh, on this topical area. Uh, we continue, you've, you've heard me use the analogy before of a kaleidoscope. Uh, we, we sometimes look out at the world through the telescope, sometimes through a microscope. Uh, and this is a topic where we're looking through a kaleidoscope. It, it seems that all of the pieces are in motion. We're trying to figure out what the technology base is doing to the, to the bio problem. We're trying to figure out foreign state programs, what they imply in the military sector. We're trying to figure out the interests of the non-state actors. We're trying to understand the role of the nuclear laboratories in doing something constructive on behalf of national and international interests. We're trying to figure out who our international partners are. We're trying to figure out who our domestic part. It's, it's all in motion. Uh, and in that sense, it's a classic new challenge for the laboratory community. Uh, it's not unlike the cyber area. It's not unlike space. Uh, where, where in today's security environment, we're presented with a, a new set of challenges. And one of the first challenges to us is to figure out the playing field. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, we're, we're fortunate today to have um, Beth Cameron here, who comes uh, with strong credentials on this topic, uh, but comes from an institution that is committed to trying to, to find that bigger picture, uh, to see the problem whole, to build new partnerships, and, and to get, get things done. And I'm as interested in her broad view of this topic as the, the, um, the in-depth parts that she's going to bring to us in a few key areas. Uh, she'll speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, this, this part will be on on the record, and then we'll go to off the record for the Q&A. Um, Beth is the Vice President for Global Biosecurity Policy and Programs at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI. Uh, she came to this role having served for an extended period as uh, Senior Director on these issues at the National Security Council staff. And prior to that, she and I uh, intersected in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, where she was again working biosecurity and biosafety issues. Please join me in welcoming Beth Cameron. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Good? OK, great. Um, so first, thank you. Thank you, Brad. And thank you so much for asking me to come today. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic. You will definitely hear that. But what I'm most interested in is actually your questions and answers when we, when we get to that point. So I hope that you um, save up some really, really good ones. And I will be diving deeply into a few areas, but I, I also agree very much with Brad that thinking about the big picture and what emerging, especially emerging technology means um, for biosecurity and biological threats, uh, accidental, deliberate, and also our ability to detect and respond to naturally occurring events. I think, um, I think that's a, it's a critical, broad topic and one where um, governments have been trying, and particularly the US government, has been trying um, for years and has, I think, focused. I think you're quite right earlier when you said that the focus has, has been uh, fairly steady over the last several years. But I really think there, there does need to be a more concerted, deeper dive into what the risk areas actually are and how we can do a better job in thinking about combating them. And so hopefully, if you have ideas about that um, from what can be done in the non-governmental sector or the governmental sector, I'm very interested in hearing them. So um, two seconds at the beginning um, about NTI. Most of you, many of you may be familiar with us for our nuclear security related work. Um, we've always had a bio program. We were started in 2001 by former US Senator Sam Nunn and philanthropist Ted Turner. Um, and we focus on weapons of mass destru destruction and disruption. Um, but the goal of NTI was really to think about what could a non-governmental partner do to influence which is what is largely a governmental fundamentally a governmental responsibility to look at countering weapons of mass destruction. And so we focus on catalyzing specific projects, working with government partners sometimes, sometimes working with the technical and the private sector to look at if there's a policy or a standard or a, a way of doing business that could actually, or, or a new novel fresh idea that's not quite ready for prime time. How can we um, catalyze that and get it into the, the more mainstream uh, practice or thinking? And so um, it's a very open slate. And our program that I've been building is relatively new. We just made a decision to bolster our bio program about a year ago. And we were successful in raising money for it from the Open Philanthropy Project, which is here 
in San Francisco and focuses on global catastrophic biological risks. So it's a long way of saying that we have a lot of uh, space in our portfolio. And so good ideas are always welcome now um, or in the future. So please use this as an opportunity to keep an open line to me and to my program and to our organization. We really value the opportunity to work with the national labs and other partners that are focused on risk. So um, I am going to spend the majority of my talk talking about um, how we are viewing risks associated with advances in technology. I'm going to talk a lot about how we're engaging non-governmental partners, but then I'm also going to talk a little bit about how that might translate into the more larger governmental conversations that are happening about health security around the world and how biosecurity and intentional and accidental risks can and should be part of that discussion. Then at the very end, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time. Um, so I'm going to spend the majority on prevention. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about detection at the end, because we are really interested um, at NTI and working with a growing number of partners who want to see real-time biosurveillance actually become a global reality instead of a buzzword. And so I'm very, I know there's a lot of people at Livermore who are thinking about this, and some of you might be in the audience. And so I did want to throw in a little of that at the end and throw it out at the beginning so that you can be thinking about any ideas you might have for us. Um, I put this quote up at the very beginning of the talk, which is from Bill Gates from February of 2017. He actually said this at the Munich Security Conference. Um, it's pretty rare to have somebody so knee deep in the global health community talk about deliberate biological risk in such a stark way, uh, where he says um, that the next epidemic could actually originate uh, from a terrorist group and that it could be something like the creation of smallpox. Um, and um, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting Bill Gates. Many of you have read um, things that he has said, and he, he's not the kind of person that just throws big pronouncements out there and lets them go boom on the table. Um, this is, the global health community is really thinking about this. They just don't know what to do about it, and they are terrified that anything that gets done will stop um, the medical countermeasure development needed to actually counter the risks that could get created. And so one of the things I've been really um, struggling with in a positive way, I mean the word struggle, is figuring out how to bring this conversation about intentional and accidental risks um, more sustainably into a global health community that really doesn't know how to talk about it, still doesn't know how to talk about it. So um, really quickly, we have at NTI, um, we're branding our bio program NTI Bio. Um, so that the N is not quite as prominent in the discussions that we have about bio work, although I'm, I'm proud to be associated with an organization doing such great work on nuclear security. Um, we're focused on technology risks. We're focused on global biosecurity capability, more traditionally defined as laboratory biosafety and biosecurity, consolidating dangerous pathogens. Um, we're also focused on biosurveillance and global catastrophic biological risks, which um, we and our funder define as risks that could actually be so great that they could have a very large impact on humanity, a large negative impact on humanity. Um, and then we're spending quite a bit of time thinking about accountability. So how can you actually tell if governments are doing the right things to prepare for uh, biological threats? And how could we measure that in a more sustainable way? And then finally, um, very focused on US and governmental leadership continuing in this area. And I'm only going to talk about a few of these things, but this is sort of the breadth of things that we're focusing on. And I'm happy to, to answer questions now or, or um, later in the talk or later after the talk on any of these areas. So I'm really preaching to the choir uh, here at Livermore when I talk about biological risks. Um, but I do uh, want to just take a second to say that I think that it's, um, it's even more important now probably than it ever has been to be able to explain in real terms to people who are decision makers in governments, in companies, in technology-driven organizations, why biological security and biological threats are a critical element of national security. And all of these things are true. Um, any disease threat has a national security related implication. But I think th that it has been underemphasized um, in past outbreaks and in past incidents, the importance of thinking about biological threats and their relationship to political instability and other elements that people who aren't thinking about even weapons of mass destruction do normally think about when they think about national and international security. 
And so I find that when I'm now I'm able, I'm in a position where I'm able to talk to Congress, congressional members, and congressional staff more than I was able to before, that making that point and talking about how WMD risks, and in particular, in, in my space, biological risks, relate to broader security questions that they're thinking about. Um, these things really do help. And so I, I say that because many of you have occasion to speak with people in the government or maybe even on the Hill. So today I'm going to talk, as I mentioned before, about three things. The two at the bottom are really one. And I'm going to start with speaking about some of the work that we're doing largely with the non-governmental sector um, around um, the absence of global norms and, and the hope that we can incentivize actions to improve um, awareness about technology risks, but also to potentially um, take some actions uh, in the technology-driven communities themselves to mitigate biological risks, maybe even as they are, are as to new technologies are being developed. So um, just to start, uh, this is a very long list of biosecurity-related policy milestones for the United States. And so usually when I, when I speak with people from, from the US, I get one of two reactions when I talk about uh, biosecurity-related policies. Um, I either get from a community like this, the US, um, the US policies are not perfect and we need to do more um, to engage the US policy community, or sometimes I get we're overregulated, there's too many policies, um, and we actually can't figure out how to deconflict all of the policies without making an argument for, for either of those two, two, um, two uh, uh, positions. Um, the one thing that I realize when I make this talk now globally, and when I talk to people from other countries, is that pretty much everything on this list doesn't exist in any other country in the world, with very few exceptions. So I'm not making an argument for the US to not do more or do better, but I am making an argument um, to think about the fact that we are actually doing a lot. And we're talking a lot, um, but when we have conversations with other governments about biological risk, we are largely, many of those conversations focus on what governments can do or how they can develop regulations or standards. Those things are critically important, but the technology and the people who are driving it and the people with the money who are driving it are um, in, in growing numbers outside of governments or even government sphere of influence. And so when we were thinking, what could we be doing as a non-governmental organization that might fill a gap in this space, um, we were thinking, how, how can we actually influence other countries to do the right thing, but also, how can we influence the technology stakeholders themselves to take actions? Um, I also just wanted to make a quick uh, side note that while the US government is doing quite a lot and we do have some good policies in place, um, the rest of the world for the standards that actually do exist in laboratory biosafety and biosecurity are by and large um, not uh, doing a, a great job on laboratory biosafety and biosecurity either. And this is a, a, um, a chart that was put together by two of my colleagues in Finland and Peru respectively to look at the WHO standards for, for adhering to the international health regulations. There's actually a specific biosecurity and biosafety piece of those standards. Um, and most countries are failing uh, really badly. So we don't have a lot of standards, and the standards that we do have are not, um, are not being adhered to. And I think more importantly for this conversation, there's no real consensus or metrics about how we would measure uh, whether um, countries or specific facilities even are uh, doing a good job with, um, with uh, risks, with measuring imp uh, and implementing standards to mitigate risks associated with advances in tech. And one of the reasons for that is because advances in technology is huge, right? We're thinking about synthetic biology, which is largely not dealing with infectious agents right now. We're thinking about virology um, and people who are working with experiments to enhance virulence and transmissibility of influenza or other viruses. We're talking about a community of people thinking about recreating new pathogens. And we're talking about people developing the technologies themselves. And these communities all have different perspectives. They're all working with different risks. And they're all largely in different conversations about risk. And so thinking about those and then layering on top of that converging risks um, and converging technologies that can be applied um, to biological technologies, we have a much broader 
um, swath. And it's very difficult to even conceive of getting to agreement on one common metric or even a small number of them. So it's a, it's a big, hard problem. That's why I'm working on it. That's why uh, probably many of you are interested in it. Um, and it matters. It matters um, because we know that technology is going to keep, uh, we're, we need to continue working with biotechnologies to make the medical countermeasures to respond to the biological risk that might actually get created by advances in technology. So it's a cyclical, um, it's a cyclical thing. And that comes down to me um, for focusing a lot more attention on the people who are actually the innovators, thinking about creating new technologies and applying um, technologies to existing tech. tech. Um, I'm going to skip the horse pox example for just a second. Um, so the challenge that we have and that we've defined um, at NTI for ourselves is scientific advances are outpacing the ability of governments to provide effective oversight. And so what does that mean and how could we actually address a risk that's this disparate and this cross-cutting? So we started by thinking, are there new and fresh stakeholders outside of governments that could be brought to the table? Um, we also asked whether there would be utility in bringing experts from the synthetic biology community, the virology community, the genomics community together in one place to talk about the different types of risk that they face but what they see as horizon, um, as risks on the horizon. And then we, we brought together, we thought, could we bring together some people who are really thinking about financial incentives um, for managing risk? And this includes sectors like the reinsurance industry, who are thinking day to day about what are the financial incentives for people to put in place standards to mitigate against risks. And um, we developed a concept um, for bringing together um, funders, so principally starting with the Wellcome Trust, which is an organization that funds biomedical research in London, the World Economic Forum, which um, is, has a huge platform for bringing together CEOs and companies from around the world, um, as well as reinsurance stakeholders, um, people who are more typically focused on biosafety and biosecurity, um, representatives from the virology community, um, companies that are focused on new advances in synthetic biology, and we smashed them together. We put them together in a meeting that happened in June in London um, at the Wellcome Trust, and we asked them to come with provocative ideas. What, we, we literally asked, what would you do in this space? Do you think that any new um, activities or standards could be put into place by technologists themselves to actually make a real difference now um, in managing biological risk. And what we got out of that um, was a whole lot of really great ideas um, that I wasn't expecting at all. Um, I don't expect you to actually read all of these, um, these uh, small font pieces of data, but I will say this. We put a survey out to this group of people who came to this meeting, this very disparate group of people, and most of them actually responded. And they responded with many more specific ideas than we thought that we would get. And so what I surmised from this is, one, we invited the right people. We also invited some people who don't spend most of their time thinking about this issue to come talk to a few people who, who do spend most of their time thinking about this issue. But the most important thing is, right now is actually a really good time to be having a conversation about this issue. There is an incredible interest um, that, that, um, that exists in the global community to talk about real biological risk, intentional, accidental, advances in technology and what they could drive. And, and I'm not exactly sure why um, it's now, but one of the things that um, was really impressed upon me listening to the executive director of the Wellcome Trust, Jeremy Farrar, talk about this is that I think there's a growing concern that something will happen and there will be a large amount of regulation uh, put into place. There's also a concern that the public, especially following the publication this year of the horsepox synthesis showing that smallpox can be synthesized, that the public and publishers and other people who are dealing with this risk on the back end, once something happens and, and you read about it in the newspaper or they're presented with an experiment and whether or not they should publish it, um, they don't have a lot of, of, um, of, uh, of milestones by which to measure, is this really a step too far, and what is a step too far in this space? And so um, there is an interest right now in thinking about that in a new and creative way. 
and so we, again, we looked at, at, at the issue broken down into a few different ways. We looked at pandemic pathogens and what kinds of standards um, we should be considering for oversight of research that could enhance transmissibility or virulence. We looked at synthetic biology and the new risks that could be posed there and, and are certainly being posed there. Um, we looked at technology development and funders and a, with a big focus on the people and the venture capitalists actually investing in new tech. And we looked at biosecurity innovation. I'm going to come back to this because it's a term that I'm going to use to describe um, whether or not it makes sense to put together a, um, the concept for a cadre of biosecurity experts like we have for cybersecurity, people that actually are looking at making technology safer and more secure as they're developing it. Is there, is there a time and a place for that? And we talked about this at this meeting in London as well as risks associated with that. And then, of course, financial incentives across the board for researchers, for grantees, um, and for technology drivers. So what did we find? What came out of this, this meeting? We, we got a lot. It was a, literally an eight-hour meeting. Um, what did we get out of it? We got 14 or 15 ideas, which can be summarized um, down into about five big things. One, um, whoa. One, financial incentives for people who are investing in synthetic biology. And the big question here is, could venture capitalists be incentivized or could there be a pilot project even with venture capitalists to incentivize a certain percentage of their investments to go into a biosafety or a biosecurity related piece of the technology that they're developing? So how could that be built out into something over the next couple of years? Two. Should there be standards for funders and grantees? And this is a, on a global basis um, asking this question. This is a tough question to ask even in the US government. And I've had many conversations in the US government around this for different types of experiments. Um, this is going to be really tough. But it also boils down to what kinds of educational processes need to be in place for the big funders who are driving uh, advances in technology, who are, who are many of whom are outside of government. Um, three, um, what uh, I call a seal of approval, um, what some people call analogous to a TSA pre-check-like concept. And I'm stealing that term, uh, not from TSA, but from somebody else who proposed it. Um, but the idea is, could you, as a researcher or a facility, show that you are a trusted um, partner or that you have certain standards that you've put in place as you're thinking about the work that you're doing or the technology that you're developing. And if you could show that, what would you get for it? Would you get access to something? Would you be streamlined for your ability to get a grant or even publish? These are controversial ideas, but worth uh, pursuing and thinking about at the facility level, um, what could drive you to, to show within your facility that you were a, a good actor, but also um, on the global stage, could you um, look at a new consortium being developed to solve a genomics problem where the only people who could actually have access to the challenge grant funding for it would have to show that they had safety and security standards in place? Four, common mechanism for screening DNA synthesis uh, orders. This is something that's being discussed by a, a lot of uh, smart people. Many of you may know Gigi Granval at the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins University or Diane Deulis. Um, at NDU, um, who have been thinking about the downfall, the problems right now, in the ability globally to actually screen um, orders for DNA synthesis. And the concept here is if somebody were to make smallpox, um, or in the case where somebody did make horsepox, um, would you catch it? And would companies catch it? And there's a cadre of companies that have banded together um, to, to actually uh, screen. DNA synthesis orders, and the US government has guidelines for how this should be done. But by and large, as and if DNA synthesis becomes more and more distributed, there's no real global way to look at this problem. And what surprised me, what really surprised me in the small meeting we had in London is how many people came to the table and said, we need this. Not just the people you would expect, but a lot of other people who said, this is the thing that I'm really worried about because I think that DNA synthesis is going to get more and more distributed. And so the question here, the big idea here, is how to translate a lot of the good ideas um, and discussions that have been happening largely here in the US and think about it on a global scale. What would DNA synthesis screening being done by an organization on a global scale look like? What kind of algorithms could be used? Um, how could they be created and updated? 
And on this one, um, there's a lot of interest from private sector partners in figuring out how to build this out now and how to get financial incentives aligned for companies to participate. And then finally, insurance incentives. This is the one that I'm the least qualified to talk about, but I will tell you that we had reinsurance um, executives at the table for this meeting, and they basically said um, to the people in the room, it was Chatham House rules, so I won't say exactly what they said, but I will say that the conversation basically went like this. We have no idea how to reinsure or insure against biological risks, but if there's an accident or an incident, we're going to be asked to figure it out and we think we should figure it out now. Um, and we had a much uh, more robust and good conversation amongst people who are actually in the laboratories at that meeting than I anticipated um, around this. And so I think quite a lot of work would have to be done to develop protocols um, that could be used by insurance um, communities and then who would actually be subject to those protocols. But for this one, I think even the act of having that conversation on a global basis with that group of people who think about biological risk and risk in general very differently from the, the, um, the life sciences community in the labs, I think it will actually help um, constructively move the conversation in the life science community forward to a place where we might actually be able to talk about some more specific things that could be done. So we also spent a little bit of, so that's what we found, and what we're doing with those ideas um, is we're taking them forward to a meeting that, um, that our CEO, um, Ernie Moniz, is going to chair in October on the margins of the International Genetically Engineered um, Machine Competition, iGEM, in Boston, where we're inviting um, an expert from, we're inviting a group of almost 20 experts from different regions of the world to come together and actually talk about some of those ideas, hopefully get some broad, agreement that it's worth pursuing some of them and then break up into almost, for lack of a better way to explain it, an almost PCAST-like style of working groups um, with global character to actually build them out. And we'll be relying on organizations like the World Economic Forum to convene companies who actually have a financial stake in some of these ideas because many of these, I think, rely really on getting the financial incentives aligned. But we also talked about this question about biosecurity innovation and catalyzing um, experts in the field to be thinking about safer and more secure built-in kind of approaches um, to biotech. And this is something that when I've raised it, um, when I raise it in different uh, communities, I get different types of feedback. So I don't know what yours will be and I can't wait to find out at the end uh, what it is. But I get, sometimes the feedback I get is, well, there's not really much you could do to build in biosafety and biosecurity into, into biotech. Sometimes I get, cool, I get cool ideas like, well, you could watermark DNA. How could we do that? How could we do it better? Um, and then there's the sort of quintessential question, could you create um, synthesis machines that just won't make certain things? And so I think all of these are, are ideas that are worth considering. Um, but for this one, there are some real open questions about if we were to do a challenge grant or a set of challenge grants on a global scale to look at making safer and more secure biotech, what are the risks that are associated with doing that kind of challenge grant? How could you do it ethically and responsibly? How could you do it without encouraging a whole generation of, of people to think about all the bad things before we had good things to actually counteract them? And, and would that be a bad thing? So on this, um, we have a little bit of funding to consider it, to bring together some smart people to think about it, to even do a challenge grant or two small. Um, but before we do, we really are soliciting ideas from the community to see if there are things that could be done that would be ethical, legal, and socially responsible. Um, and of course, I mentioned before that we're thinking about the incentives. So there's still some very hard questions associated with everything that I just discussed. What are the incentives uh, for people outside of governments, um, financial and otherwise? Um, for what I just spoke about, are, what, are ap what kinds of applications are there where built-in strategies for biosecurity are, are going to be feasible? For, for some hardware applications, you could see that it could work, but um, it's, it's challenging to think about how it would apply um, across the board. Um, could we, should we, actually think about building a, a career cadre in the U.S. and around the world of people who are thinking about biosecurity from a technical 
perspective, largely the biosafety and biosecurity community, and I put it in quotes as a member of that community, we're largely policy driven. There are, there are some people in, in, in the lab who focus on these issues largely from a biosafety perspective, but um, should there really be a technical community that's thinking about this? And I think if there is a technical community thinking about this, a lot of them are here in, in the national labs in this room, perhaps. So I don't want to sell you guys short at all. I just think globally this isn't a concept um, yet. And then how to mitigate um, risks, including um, if we were to do a, a technology challenge grant on biosecurity built in. So that's what I want to say about uh, advances in technology risks and what we're thinking about. And I know that I've posed many more questions than I've answered, but I definitely hope that I got you thinking and I look forward to some questions about it at the end. Um, I'm going to focus the remainder of my talk on two um, areas where I'm going to deviate just a little bit. Um, the second area that I want to talk about is um, governmental actions in biosecurity. And here I'm talking about what I just spoke about, emerging risks, um, but I'm also thinking about even more traditional biosafety and biosecurity, which I think is still important. I think we shouldn't get too hung up on lists of agents, but I do think that it's important to continue to consider um, that there are um, high containment laboratories being built around the world. There are, um, you know, stores of dangerous pathogens sitting still unprotected. And we should still be thinking about these issues even while we're thinking about what's, what's on the horizon next. And then at the end, I'm going to just say a couple words about biosurveillance to get your, thought, your thoughts um, moving. So I mentioned already that for the, the areas of biosafety and biosecurity where there are international standards now, um, and this includes, you know, has your country, um, do you have an, has, does your country have an inventory of its dangerous pathogens? Do you know where they're stored? Um, do you have um, standard biosafety and biosecurity training practices in place for laboratories across, um, across um, your country? For those kinds of questions, there now is actually an external evaluation which looks at a lot more things than biosafety and biosecurity, but does actually look at biosafety and biosecurity. And for 62 countries that have been assessed as of um, June of this year, um, only 3% of those countries were assessed to have sustainable capability in this area. Um, and what, what it means two things. The, the first one is that there's a, a challenge here, even with traditional biosafety and biosecurity. But the second is that there actually aren't a lot of people who are doing these assessments who have a biosafety and biosecurity background because these assessments are largely focusing on epidemic risk on a very broad scale. And so when the WHO took on the process of doing these global health security related assessments, um, they were very focused and, and not wrongly so on whether countries have emergency operations centers in place, whether they have epidemiologists um, to do contact tracing for epidemics like Ebola. Um, and these questions are hugely important. Um, and um, I don't want to minimize them in any way, but biosafety and biosecurity was a little bit of a footnote, and it was a footnote that the U.S. government and a few other governments really asked to make sure got included um, in these assessments. And so I think it's incumbent on experts um, around the world to make sure that as these assessments are happening that the biosafety and biosecurity components are really robust. And I know you had Jerry Parker in here a couple of months ago talking about global health security. He probably talked a little bit about the global health security agenda, which I spend a, a lot of, of time uh, still thinking about. Um, this came out of, of that uh, work, and um, biosafety and biosecurity is still sort of a, a, minim a less, less uh, focused on piece. Um, so it's vital, but still underrepresented in the larger conversation. And I, I always feel that it's important to point out, especially to people who work in the nuclear security general space too, that the global biosecurity assistance budget, so this isn't the US government's budget for biosafety and biosecurity, this is the budget globally available to assist other countries to have biosafety and biosecurity practices in place. Back of the envelope calculation, which I don't think is too far off, it's like 300 million a year total. And about two thirds of that is the US government's cooperative biological engagement program at DOD, coupled with the State Department biosecurity engagement program. And then the rest of that is largely the government of Canada, a little bit from Germany, a contribution from the Netherlands, um, some technical expertise and a small project from Finland. And the fact that I can actually tell you all of these projects and who they are, and I, I say that even on the record because I know them so well, um, 
is, is troubling. There's just not a lot of, of countries that are invested in this particular piece of the broader security equation or a global health equation, and both of those communities actually should be, in my opinion, focusing on this issue. We also have a challenge that the global programs that do care about this are not necessarily all measuring using the same metrics. And so when they go in to, to think about, is this country prepared, the EU, for example, has a, an assessment for CBRN capability in a, in a, in a, for the capability of a country to counter CBRN threats. The WHO has an assessment for how countries are doing on biological threats from a public health perspective, and those metrics aren't yet aligned. Um, and so that's a persistent challenge that, that some of us, in a very wonky sort of way, really want to fix. But that, that is making it harder to show that in financial investments are actually making a difference. And that means that people don't want to invest in this area. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, there's also limited tracking and accountability um, for people that make commitments in this area, but then actually may not follow through on them. And um, that's, that's definitely something that NTI, through a separate project that I'm not talking, going to talk a lot about here, is taking on and trying to address. Um, and then finally, um, just the, the broad um, statement, but fact, that competing priorities really dilute focus on this area. And I think that's true in the US government as well as around the world that this particular slice of health security is, a, is still a niche, very much a niche area that not that many people fund in and not that many people focus on as their whole day job. So all of those things um, just um, lead me to um, to talk in all of these different sectors about why biosecurity is important. But I think um, one of the things that I've found now that I'm outside of government working with the broader global health sector is that there actually isn't that much resistance amongst people that work on, um, on disease threats like malaria, TB, HIV, AIDS. There's not much resistance to thinking about deliberate and accidental threats as an important part of global health. It's how you engage them, how you talk about it, and how, um, how you think about these things together as one set of important issues. Um, and how you brief them uh, in meetings. And so I'm the tri-chair of the Global Health Council's Global Health Security Roundtable, which is a group of policy uh, people in Washington that brief the Hill on a regular basis and have occasion to talk to the administration and the Office of Management and Budget. And just by coming to the table as NTI, we've been able to get biosecurity onto the, onto the radar screen of a larger number of groups. And as long as we're all respectful about the fact that all of these things are important, um, threats for humanity. Um, we haven't had resistance. And so I, I do think that there's an open door. I, I think that the health security um, dichotomy that many of us have spent our careers talking about, um, it does still exist, the, um, this, you know, this headbutting between communities. But it's, it's really not that hard to bridge that gap if you try uh, and if you bring um, uh, people to the table that can, that can talk to each other. So um, we are. Um, talking about biosecurity as part of the health security um, lens, we're also talking about it as part of health system strengthening and as part, even part of the sustainable development goals. It's, it's a critical component of all of these things. Um, and we're working with governments as a very specific piece of the global health security agenda and also as part of the global partnership against the spread of weapons and materials of mass destruction, which is a G7 entity that looks at WMD threats. Um, we're working, we, NTI, are working with both of those communities to bring together um, governments um, to make very specific commitments to take action on, on biosafety and biosecurity, and more importantly, to actually account for those actions over the next couple of years. And so we, um, we sort of inserted ourselves into the global health security agenda as a non-governmental actor interested in this space, and we got a lot of support for doing that because most governments don't have a lot of time to track the commitments of other governments. Um, and we're able to actually get this idea of emerging risks associated with advances in technology more integrated into that discussion by being at the table and having it. So in my last five to seven minutes or so, um, I want to switch gears completely um, from largely prevention focused um, subject to talk a little bit about detection of global catastrophic biological risks. Um, detection of emerging 
pathogens, detection of unknown, heretofore unknown threats, detection of engineered threats. Um, and um, here, I do not, um, I have even less answers than I had in the beginning of my talk, but I do want to spend a couple of minutes um, because I've been, uh, as many of you have, on, on this journey to think about what real-time biosurveillance actually means, where we are with that journey, and what we could actually do to chart a real vision and steps towards achieving something that looks a lot more like real-time biosurveillance than we have right now. So really quickly, um, a definition. The definition of global catastrophic biological risk that I'm using when I'm talking about um, detection here is the definition that the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security published um, last year in health security. But by and large, we're talking about really high consequence events that are either start as a lower consequence event and become a higher consequence event because of cascading effects or the political um, socio or economic climate in which they occur. Or we're talking about engineered threats, threats for which there are no medical countermeasure, um, or just emerging infectious disease risks that we're not anticipating that cause a, a disproportionately large number of fatalities. So we're talking about the needle in the haystack. How do we actually detect the needle in the haystack? So um, I, will, I will own this challenge because I, I wrote it for this talk and just say just from the heart that we really haven't made very much progress toward real-time biosurveillance. I see Chuck smiling. Um, we've, many of us have tried. Um, we've even used the word real-time biosurveillance in an effort to make it clear that we're talking about no, really, we mean real-time. Um, but it's really challenging to get there even on, in the U.S. system. Um, much less on a global basis. And there's lots of reasons for this. Sharing data in real time is hard. Driving better data is hard. Um, it's really hard to share that data before, during, and after a crisis. And it's hard to have the MOUs in place to do that. And then we, we always have a hard time predicting what the next crisis is going to be. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the last one, and we don't necessarily prepare for what's in front of us. And I say none of that to throw stones at, at myself or at any of us who spend a lot of time on this issue. But it really is um, a challenge that has so many different component parts. There needs to be a very concerted, specific um, effort to map out what all of those challenges are and to start solving them one by one with a lot of um, new infusion of finances. And I say that confidently because I do think that there is um, there are a group of foundations and experts that I've run into um, over the last um, couple of months, which I'm happy to share more when we get to the off the record part, um, who are thinking about how to do that, how to catalyze a global effort that really looks at, at, at the decadal problem of real-time biosurveillance. And so you know, the goal is being able to predict disease outbreaks before they occur, detect them rapidly, provide precision targeting to respond better to outbreaks as they're moving around. And then additional but critically important hurdle um, for us, for this community, for me, um, traditional mechanisms aren't designed um, to detect novel emerging or engineered threats. And so it breaks down into three, three specific components, driving data that integrate public and private feeds, democratizing data science, um, wide sharing of pathogen sequence data, and not just pathogen sequence data, but when we start looking at transcriptomics, um, proteomics, the, actually looking at what happens downstream of the pathogens and being able to use um, modern data analytics and machine learning to drive better understanding of what's happening, um, it, what's happening and how we would detect it, even if we don't know what's causing it. Um, Active analysis, so providing analytical tools that countries and, and researchers can, can access um, a more, on a more regular basis that wouldn't necessarily require them to get the data set sent to them, which is sometimes challenging for a wide variety of reasons, but would allow them to actually analyze or compare information that they have against it. Um, figuring out how to do that on a global scale and asking a question, uh, is there actually um, a role for an international organization, not necessarily within the UN system, but some international organization to provide that function. And then finally, actually, if we had better data and better analytics applied on a, on a more global scale, could we actually make that data available um, during a crisis um, to actually help drive a better response to it? Um, and this is just um, a very uh, uh, 
very crude way of trying to show all of those three things and the immense, um, the immense piece of this problem. Um, but what, one of the p places where I'm most interested right now is on driving data. So how and whether we could actually put together working with one or more foundations um, and a country or two, um, a pilot to show that we could actually drive uh, better access to private sector data sets, um, better access to pathogen genomic sequencing. There are some foundations, including Gates, who are really interested in how to get these tools into the hands of countries on a more regular basis, and could there be some opportunities to think about how to do that and then how to make that data uh, more readily available to the people that need to analyze it and then provide the results of those analytics back to countries so they can actually use them. Um, and so also thinking about not just bringing the data to researchers, but bringing algorithms that research have to the data that is, um, that is made available by, uh, by the people that have it. So this is a huge problem. I would love your thoughts on it. Um, we um, at NTI have a little bit of bandwidth and funding to think about what we might catalyze in this area. And um, it's such a broad problem that we're um, spending a lot of time uh, trying to figure out exactly what to focus on. But there, there is um, a lot of interest right now in breaking this problem down into component parts that could actually be funded and solved um, in, a, in, a much, um, in a much more concerted fashion. Skip that one. And so that is it. Um, with that, I leave you with my final slide, which is just, um, I've spent a lot of time talking about global implementation because that's what we do uh, and because I think that there, the, while the conversation in the U.S. isn't always what we want it to be, the conversation globally is very challenging and um, thinking about how to make progress on any of the issues I talk about on a global basis is even harder. But U.S. leadership is absolutely irreplaceable and I, I definitely want to leave um, this group with that sentiment because the work that you do here and how it translates into U.S. government policy and the programs that the U.S. government continues to sponsor in countering biological risk are vital. If we're not at the table, if we're not leading, I, I view, we can't set the norms or the standards for, for um, that we ourselves want to abide by or that we want to see others abide by. And so I make this point in every, every talk that I give, but I just want to say that and also just thank you for the focus you continue to bring to this problem. Thanks.